Welcome to Education Forum. I'm Herman Badillo, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the City University. The improvement of education affects all New Yorkers. This program will focus on the key educational issues and challenges before us all. My guest today is Diane Ravage, who is one of the foremost scholars in education in this country. She is a research professor at uh, New York University and a senior fellow of the Brookings Institution. She has written or edited uh, 17 books, and her latest book is called uh, Left Back, A Century of Failed School Reforms. The New Republic, in a recent review, said that her book is the most important book written about the most important uh, public institution in America today, the schools. And her book is an authoritative uh, history of education in the 20th century. Diane, welcome. And what I'd like you to do is uh, not easy to summarize the 20th century in terms of school reforms quickly. I think we can begin um, before the beginning of the 20th century with, in 1892, I believe, there was a committee of 10 yes. that was appointed to prepare a program. And then right. uh, tell us about that from there on. Well, what, what I've tried to do in this book is to tell a story and to give all of the evidence to say this is not just my story, this is what happened. Uh, it's a century of arguing about education. It's a century that began with an ideal that we would try to provide the same quality of education for all children. And the ideal, which was stated in the 1890s, was very far from reality. Very few children in the 1890s went to high school. Uh, very even fewer graduated from high school. Um, for many children from uh, racial minorities, there were no high schools available. But the ideal was, as we began to expand high schools and to reach all children, the quality of education should be the same for all. Well, what's wrong with the ideal? It's a wonderful ideal. It's, it's actually my ideal. It's my uh, ideal, too. But yeah. the story of the 20th century has been a constant assault on this idea. And who, and who was the assaulter? Well, there were bad ideas, and I, I, don't, I don't castigate individuals, but I do hold up to examination ideas that have had very bad effects. Uh, one of the examples uh, that, that I would give in giving this kind of quick capsule summary is the importance, the negative importance of IQ testing. And when the IQ test was first invented in the beginning of the 20th century, it was supposed to be a way of helping children, help identify children who had special needs. But then it was used on a massive basis in World War I to say these, these few will be the officers and this large number are not smart enough to be officers. They'll go out to the trenches. But when World War I was over, the education psychologists took these IQ tests and marketed them to America's public schools. And they said, IQ is fixed, it's changeable, it's innate, it's inherited. And once you can identify who are the very smart ones and who are the not so smart, you can give your very best uh, teaching, your best education to the few and fit the others to, for jobs. Well, forgetting about the application, the, the, the theory that IQ does measure intelligence is still a, a prevailing uh, theory today. What's wrong with that? Well, IQ measures intelligence, but, uh, but it's all relative. In other words, uh, intelligence can change. Uh, children in the same family have different kinds of intelligence. And even if you could accurately identify a child's intelligence, you can, by, through education, provide greater opportunities and greater possibilities for it, not for making the child uh, a, a, you know, a genius or a Newton, but to expose that young man or woman to the greatest ideas that have been known in the world. This is a possibility with virtually everybody. I mean, there are very small numbers of young people who have a, a very uh, you know, serious mental or learning problems. The vast majority of people can be educated. And what I showed was- So if was you have an, only an average IQ, you, should, you would be able to be educated. Of course. Uh, and what happened after World War I was that there were many books written about the IQ testing in the Army. And the, the leading psychologists were saying, the average American is stupid. The average American has the intelligence of a 13-year-old. And so uh, there was legislation passed to limit immigration uh, because the assumption was, well, all these immigrants are <clears throat> dragging down our country. And, and this was wrong because what, the, what we saw in the Army IQ test was the longer people, uh, men and women who were immigrants, stayed in America, 
the better they knew the language, and the better they knew the English language, the better they did on the IQ test. The IQ test was not really a, a measurement of native intelligence so much as it was a measure of educational opportunity. Now, you say in your book that there were different uh, purposes to which uh, schooling was uh, referred to, that it started with the ideal that you mentioned, that everybody can get and should get and must get a basic education, and then the school became uh, a forum for other things. Tell well, us about many that. of the, uh, I, if, if my, one way to characterize my book is that it's very critical of the educational theorist, and the educational theorist who were ensconced in the great institutions of, let's say, the pedagogical institutions, who had theories about who should be educated and who should not be educated. Uh, some of them had theories about how to reform society. Uh, my own view is the way you reform society is one child at a time, and you do this by educating everybody in the very best way you know how. Uh, the educational theorist, however, saw social reform in a variety of ways. One was, let's prepare some children, a few for college, and the others for jobs. And so th we had, for example, the industrial education movement in the beginning of the century. And they were marking children at the age of 10, 11, and 12 and saying, these are the children sh that should be prepared for factory work. Now, how did you know who is, should be prepared for factory work? Well, what did their parents do? They were factory workers mm -hmm. or farm workers, so the children should be given the same kind of occupational training. But that was justified as a progressive step. This, this right? was considered very progressive because uh, because the theorists didn't like an academic education. They thought academic, in their mind, was a very negative term. Um, in my mind, and this is what I emphasize through the book, an academic education is the education that we give to elites. And the great promise of American education is that we would give the elite education to everybody and not just to the children of the well-born and the children of bankers and, and uh, professionals. Well, unfortunately, that uh, theory that academic education uh, is uh, left to a certain group. Uh, today is a prevalent idea, according to uh, John McWhorter, uh, his book, uh, Losing the Race, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you read, indicates that uh, uh, this is a feeling that exists uh, among many black and Latino groups. Well, you know, I, I, I've traveled uh, in different parts of the country talking about the book and trying to explain how what are the ideas you know, that, that, that we swim in? What is the context in which we come up with different education reforms? And so as I explain this fundamental idea of tracking, of saying this is the elite, the elite gets the elite education, and then the 80% or the 70% will get something watered down, so many people call in, especially in these call-in shows, and they say, that's what happened to me. I was told in seventh grade that I should be a secretary, mm -hmm. and it was only later that I discovered that I really could learn how to read. I really could. I really had the potential for college education. And so many people discovered too, too late or, or later in life. And I think it's one of the wonderful aspects of our higher education system that we don't close the door and that we give people endless second chances to say, yes, I want to do this work and I can make my life different. Listen, that almost happened to me because in high school, uh, I was, uh, I couldn't speak English very well because I came here when I was 12 and um, from Puerto Rico, but I was put into a, a class uh, for uh, airplane mechanics, vocational course. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, I, I was able to transfer to the academic uh, diploma just in time, just barely in time. Otherwise, I would now be unemployable because uh, because uh, what you learned not that is many not jobs easy. in airplane mechanics. Right. Um, but tell me this: is this something that happened in America? What, what has been the situation in U European countries, for example? In European countries, uh, these countries, first of all, have a very strong academic program, usually till about age 12 or 13 or 14. And then they openly and consciously say, you will go into the college track. We were not doing this openly. And this is my big complaint, was that we were, there was a pretense of having a democratic system of equal educational opportunity, when in fact we w had adopted on a virtually a European tracking system without admitting to it. And uh, I think one of the uh, most powerful stories that, that I tried to describe was what happened particularly with African-American youth, uh, where the most Afri of the, our African-American population in the 30s and the 40s was in the South with terrible educational systems where their parents were illiterate or, or barely literate. The children had maybe a fourth or fifth grade education and then were left school to go work in the fields. 
And these were the families that moved to the north, desperately in need of education, and came to cities like New York and Chicago and, and other uh, Detroit, other major urban centers, where they encountered a school system that said, oh, we tested this child, he has a low IQ, lowest mm -hmm. track, low expectations. The effort to raise this child up were very limited because of the, the built-in assumption that the IQ explains why this child uh, is so parents, far behind. And the parents were not given the, uh, the necessary reinforcement to uh, make them feel that their children could achieve. Right. So that contributed to the fact that they had not had a tradition of education coming in from the South, right? Right, and then too, uh, in, in terms of the kinds of schooling that was available for children, it wasn't simply a matter of tracking and low expectations. But in the inner city schools, it, these were the most, uh, uh, the worst schools. They had the greatest turnover of teachers. Uh, Kenneth Clark wrote a very powerful uh, series of books in the 1950s and 60s describing how, how the hostility between the teachers and the children and the lack of remediation of intensive, what these kids needed was intensive instruction and they were not getting it. Instead they were getting low track, low expectations. Before we get to um, New York City and New York State, tell me about the Asian kids, for example in Japan, because the Asian kids seem to be, do, be doing better in our system, no? Well the Asian kids have one enormous advantage which is in their culture uh, they grow up with the belief that effort is paramount. Uh, in our culture, because of this, I believe because of the inheritance of the IQ testing movement, we say, well, you know, you either have it or you, or you don't, and if you don't have it, give up. Don't try. And then we reinforce this emphasis on ability, not effort, by allowing children to have a wide range of choices. So children say, well, I'm not really good at that. I won't take that course, and I won't take that course. I won't take history, and I won't take science, and I won't, I'll take the lowest level math. So they, in effect, they track themselves. The Asian kids don't have a choice? The Asian children don't have these choices, and they have a, uh, the cultural, the education culture says, if you work hard, you can get it. Effort is what counts above all. And the mothers and the, and the parents believe this, and they reinforce it constantly to the children. Hard work produces results. And that tradition is brought over here. Yes. And, you know, when the Asian kids see the American school system, they say, well, this is like coming into a room full of candy. I can do all of these things. If I work at it, I will learn English. Uh, and they know that they can't succeed in our society without mastery of the English language. So they work hard at learning English. You'll notice in the bilingual programs, and at least in New York City, and I'm sure this is true everywhere, the Hispanic children remain in bilingual for many years. Right, up many, to eight many years more, and more. Six, seven, eight years. Asian children get out of bilingual programs as rapidly as they can, and uh, they understand hard work produces success, and that's what we should be teaching all of our kids. We'll be back after these announcements. I'm principal of a new kind of public school. It's open up to 15 hours a day, year round. It has loads of academic, cultural, and recreational activities. We have medical and dental services right here. Our teachers have more time to teach. Our students are better prepared to learn. There's just one problem. We can't get the kids to go home. Find out how your public school can be more like this one. Call 1-877-LOVE-TO-LEARN. We're back today with Diane Ravitch, an educational scholar whose latest book is Left Back, A Century of Fail School Reforms. Now, we talked about the problem nationally, but let's talk now about New York City and New York State. Uh, you support standards and I support standards, and New York State, Commissioner Mills and uh, Chancellor Hayden, and the Board of Regents have come out for uh, having standards in high school so that in the very near future, no student will be able to get a high school diploma unless they pass the Regents. And you've been critical of that in an article in the New York Times. Why is that? 
Well, uh, my first criticism was that I didn't feel that the state standards were good enough. I, I felt that it's important if you're going to, to make that the basis for finishing high school, the standards should be very clear so that teachers know what to teach, students know what's expected of them. You mean and the standards in every grade? Yes, and yeah. also I felt I had reviewed the English standards and the uh, social studies standards, and I felt that in the case of the English, it was, so, it was very vague. Uh, really, it's not especially demanding. And then in the history, or the uh, global history and, and U.S. history, it's just the amount of material is simply overwhelming, so that it would be very hard for a teacher to know this is what I'm, the students will be held accountable for. So my first criticism was that I thought that, they, that the state needs to improve the standards and make, be much clearer without being trivial. Um, I, I believe now, as we get closer to the time where the standards are going to really begin to have an impact, uh, that, the, that Commissioner Mills and the Regents should offer opportunities to, for, for schools who, that have a very conscientious objection to, this, to the Regents, and there are such schools, they should allow them to say, we will have students take the international baccalaureate exams. This is much more difficult than the Regents, but some schools say they'd rather do that. Really? They why, why would they want to take a more difficult exam? Because there are some schools that say anything but the Regents. I, I mean, regents I don't is, agree. Because the Regents is, is not tough enough. Frankly, no, I, no. one of the things I don't like about the Regents is that uh, while it appears that they have very high standards, in fact, uh, they lowered the right. passing mark to 55, well, which to they me did. And is, is not having and, high standards. And also, when you realize that uh, in the past only 20-something percent of students in New York City were passing the Regents, now it's up in the 90s, you have to believe that the scoring uh, of these exams not, not is much strong. less yeah. than what it used to be. Yeah. But some schools have conscientious objection to the Regents, so they should be able to take advanced placement exams, they should be able to take SAT exams. There should be, I, be I believe, for those schools that have this recoil factor, they should have these alternatives, but it shouldn't be just low minimum standards. Uh, but I think that there is virtue in having uh, multiple exit routes, as long as they all represent a clear standard. What I am very troubled by is that I have seen uh, newspaper reports of high school principals who say it's wrong to expect my children to pass standards because my children are foreign born they can't pass the English regions. Well I'm told that at and, the city university. Right but you know you have to ask and at least I ask myself why would they want to give a high school diploma from the city of New York to a student who can't read and write English. It's the job of the school, the high school to, to teach these things and not to make excuses about why it can't be done. Well, but this is still happens. Commissioner Mills tells me that uh, even though uh, the school's chancellor and the principals and others have asked that the, uh, the, the provision of the regions be uh, pulled back, he won't do it because he wants to keep the pressure on, especially in the New York uh, Board of Education. Well, you know, I think that uh, there, there are many people who object to the pressure, but what has happened nationally is, I think, very relevant to New York. The, having an exam, which at the end of the day students must pass, has created enormous pressure to increase uh, instruction, uh, to improve, <coughs> improve the quality of teachers, uh, increase the amount of pre-kindergarten uh, instruction, because people say it's not fair. But if it's not fair, what are we going to do about it? You can't just say abolish the exam. What you have to look at is the whole educational system and say, why are kids beginning first grade not knowing uh, you know, the most basic kind of vocabulary that they need? And as you look across the system, what this exit exam is forcing people to do is to strengthen the, the, the entire K through 12 system. Okay, now you wrote another article which addresses that issue for the City Journal called Our School Problems and Its Solutions. Now, why are kids coming into the first grade uh, unprepared for school? Well, I, I do think that we need to have much, much better pre-K programs. And I, I didn't go into this in this article. I think that Head Start has been very disappointing. And I've looked at the latest evaluations of Head Start. And many, many of our New York City kids are in Head Start programs. Head Start doesn't even attempt to teach children in most Head Start centers. They don't attempt, attempt to teach them literacy, numeracy. They don't give them the kinds of enrichment, uh, intellectual enrichment, uh, that they would get if they were in a middle class home. So I think that Head Start needs to be changed. We need to have better trained teachers in Head Start, better paid teachers in Head Start. Well, New York State just recently passed um, a, a pre-K uh, program and money mm -hmm. for it, uh, which should help what you have. But 
Tell me this. No matter what the pre-K or the Head Start program is, how can the children, especially from uh, area in the America, African American and Latino families in the South Bronx, can they ever be prepared for school adequately? Yes, uh, but it requires, I believe, I mean, by uh, again, the parents before they get by to the, the school. parents. I think that some parents can't do this, and this is why we have schools. And and you know, many people have said to me, "Well, how can you really expect to?" have children meet standards when they come from such different homes. In other and words, the can the schools make up the difference between what a, uh, a, a poor uh, family where nobody in the family has a good education and a family that, uh, where the parents are all college graduates? The, the, Both kids come yeah, into the, the, the first grade. The can, children, that be, can that be uh, Right. The children whose, whose parents have uh, a college education will always have a huge advantage. But the reason we have public schools is to narrow that advantage. And the schools have to consciously attempt to reduce and, if possible, eliminate the, that, that huge gap. This is very difficult. But this is why it's so important that we have well-trained teachers, not just well-trained, but well-educated teachers, that we have teachers who themselves speak the English language, read the English language, know how to teach reading. I mean, the, the reading well, well, instruction... Do we, do we have those teachers? No, we don't. I well, mean, we do in some cases. I won't say no across the board. But the reading instruction in the city is still wedded to something called whole language. And I describe in my book how whole language has well, failed. What is that? What is whole oh, language? Oh, this is the idea that you don't actually teach children to read. You just surround them with books. Well, this, does, this is fine if, you, if both your parents are college educated because mo many of those kids learn, actually learn to read at home. Poor children need instruction. And very, I don't know of any teacher training institution in the city of New York that teaches teachers uh, about phonics, for example. And all of the research for the last 50 years has said children need to be taught the relationship between letters and the sounds. That's called phonics. But our teacher training institutions don't teach our teachers that. So we, we fail with reading instruction to begin with. And then when children are very fragile, when they have come from a home where the parents are not educated, they need, they need the best instruction. And instead, they're getting bad theory, poor education, poorly trained teachers. And it's not fair to their teachers. And the teachers should have much better instruction okay. as, and be able to give better instruction. OK, so let's go back now to the point that we started at. Uh, you, you said that we had the 20th century was a century of failed school reforms. Now the 20th century is over, and we're beginning the 21st century. What should be the uh, approach in the 21st century? Well, on different levels, first of all, we sh I would love to see a revolution in teacher training. I would love to see teachers, the best educated well, we, people. Well, we have teacher training at uh, City University. Well, sure, what you have teacher do? training. What could you we do? could uh, insist that teachers not just take lots of methods courses, but take courses in art and history and, and mathematics and science and come through their teacher training program well-educated people, so that whether they're going to be elementary teachers or teach at some other level, they themselves are educated people, not just with methods, uh, but really knowledgeable and, and able to help the children become educated people. That would be a start. <coughs> um, I think that we should change this, this vast school bureaucracy that we have at the Board well, of Education. Well, let's go back to teacher training, because um, I've just set up at the City University a dean for teacher education, mm -hmm. which we didn't have before, in order to revise the teacher training. And secondly, we now have at uh, CUNY something else we didn't have before. We will now be having a, a graduate degree, a PhD in teacher education, in order to bring about uh, those reforms. Well, reforms. unfortunately, it probably won't lead to what I'm describing, but it's probably, like the state, you will be requiring more courses in the study of education. But the study of education is not education. An well, educated it's up to person, us. We can, we right. can, de we can uh, design the but, courses. So you should look at your requirements and say, is this someone who will be a master teacher of science? Is this someone who will be able to relate science and technology to culture and history and be able to look at, at, uh, at civilization and get kids excited about learning? Or is this somebody who has got filled with learning theory, uh, methodology, skills, and has not, uh, done nothing but read books about, about education rather than becoming an educated person. Does the Regents' exam for teachers adequately test the ability of the person to be a teacher? 
Well, I haven't taken the exam, and I've, I, I, I'm not, I can't speak from firsthand. My impression is that it's not, a, uh, it's not an examination that um, measures whether people are that sort of well-educated person. I think the first level of responsibility is with each university, with your university, with the constituent parts of it, to see that, that people in different parts of the university, in the mathematics department, in the science departments, and all of the real subject matter departments are working closely with the education school to make sure that the teachers have not just training but education. Well, listen, I, uh, I would like your help in designing uh, a better program Good. for teacher education I'll be because happy to do this. Uh, I have not certainly been satisfied. We have not had, uh, in the past, we haven't had uh, great success. We've had great success in some of the colleges, but we haven't in the other colleges. And as far as I'm concerned, uh, the test is whether we can. Uh, duplicate and replicate the programs throughout. Well, one of the things you can look at is uh, the, 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 um, whether you have in your teacher training institutions courses in teaching reading that are balanced courses between what's called whole language, which is just let kids figure it out all by themselves, uh, surrounded with wonderful materials. And phonics, phonetic instruction is very important. The National Research Council, which is the most eminent scientific group in the country, has said Teaching phonics has got to be part of reading, but it's not in most of our teacher training institutions. So this would be important also for CUNY. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Thank you. You can reach us by email at our website, www.cuny.tv, or write to us at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016.